on a beautiful Sunday day in Philadelphia. And uh, we're going to transition to the next person. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Our next presenter's name is Melissa Ann Thomas. Um, gathering that um, she, oh, yeah, I see her. Thank you. Good to see you. Glad Hello. You. <laughs> She's uh, um, interested in language acquisition, and um, she's currently working on, uh, she has recently been working on a variety of different um, language acquisition topics, including American Sign Language. And she's currently working on a novel for National Novel Writing <laughs> Month. And she's um, been studying so many interesting different parts, including astronomy. But most importantly, she's an English teacher like everyone here, or almost everyone here. And she's interested in uh, talking today about strategies for empowering student growth. I'm so happy and honored to welcome Melissa Ann Thomas from America, been teaching in France for many, many years and all over the world. Um, thanks so much for coming, Melissa. Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk on feedback washback in academic writing strategies for empowering student growth. So before I begin, I'd just like to thank uh, Manisha Ka from Online World of Learning for inviting me here today. I'm so excited to be here and share my experiences. As she said, I'm Melissa Ann, and I'll be guiding you through <clears throat> my experiences as both an academic writing instructor and a proofreader at University of Paris-Saclay in France. So just to say also, forgive me, I've been sick. So um, if my voice sounds a little rough <clears throat> or I'm clearing my throat a lot, it's I'm just getting over a little cold. So um, I imagine that there are a lot of you out there who, like me, um, have been lifelong bookworms and writers. Like Manisha said, I'm in the process of um, participating in National Novel Writing Month. <laughs> but even as a child, no matter where I went, I always had my nose in a book or a pencil in my hand. And in fact, I can remember one time when we went to go and visit my grandparents. I must have been about eight years old or something like that. And um, I just plonked myself down at the kitchen table and just started writing in my little journal. And my grandfather, the, who you see in the picture here, um, came up beside me. Now, I'm at that point, I was the youngest cousin, and I didn't really have a whole lot of interaction with him. So I was already surprised that he had come over to see what I was up to. But beyond that, um, he uh, did not speak a word of English. And um, my whole assignment was in English. He only spoke Spanish. So when I looked over at him, I noticed he had a book um, that was all about learning how um, to speak English. And he set the book down, sat down beside me. And I don't know how long we sat there side by side, but um, I helped him. I helped him construct a couple of sentences in English. And um, I've never forgotten that moment. It was one of the very few times I had his full attention. Um, but what I never forgot was, first of all, just how much effort it took him to construct those sentences, how much courage it took him to sit down next to this little eight-year-old <laughs> with her nose buried in her book, but also the pleasure he had in, um, in actually constructing a sentence himself. Um, before I continue, I just want to make sure, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> um, so that pleasure, that joy that he took in expressing himself, even though, you know, it was, I went to the store and bought some eggs. Um, <clears throat> I've never forgotten that. And I hold that inside of me whenever I work with um, ESL learners, but also in particular with ESL writers. But then also another experience that has influenced me as an instructor is my sibling. So my sibling is the complete opposite of me. Um, he does not enjoy writing. He does not enjoy reading. <laughs> and he's very functional, um, whether it's a report at his job or it's a letter or an email. Um, he just puts the bare bones down and that's it. Functional, straight to the point. 
And so, in fact, today when I work with academic writers, scientific writers, a lot of them have the same approach as my brother. They just want to get the facts down and get it out there, and they don't really care too much about what happens on the other side. So the focus of my talk today is actually going to kind of bring those two aspects together when we're working with ESL writers, the aspects of language learning and the struggles they face, and also this idea of motivation and what gets them um, um, excited about writing. <clears throat> so in terms of my own path in life, since being eight years old, since sitting next to my grandfather, I've worn many, many hats, as Manisha mentioned. I've been an ESL tutor. I've been a language researcher on how children learn languages and how adults learn their second languages. I've been an instructor for children, an English instructor for children here in France and in Taiwan. And I've been a speech um, therapy assistant and um, coming up to today where I am both a proofreader and an academic writing instructor. So before I dive into the workshop today, I just want to give a little bit of background of the unique situation um, that I actually work in. So um, as I mentioned, I work at the Academic Writing Center here in France. And what this is, is a writing and language support service available to the research community at the University of paris saclay And it's funded by the French National Research Council. And up until 2019, um, there was actually zero resources for ESL writers um, at the university, at the doctoral, uh, postdoc, and faculty level zero. Tons and tons of resources for bachelors and master's students, but nothing for um, the, the community at large. And so our, our director, Divya Madhavan, decided, well, let's create something for the community, freely accessible, um, that people can access and come to with help for developing their written material in English. Because um, as we all know, uh, the language of science at the moment is English, no matter what the French like to think <laughs> English is the universal language at the moment. So, um, so in order for us to be participating in international research, um, Divya created the Academic Writing Center. So just to briefly tell you about the two services that we provide, we provide proofreading, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in depth. Um, so any document that's in English, people can come and get our input on that. And then we also have workshops and courses um, that not only emphasize writing, um, because that's how we started, but we also know that our postdocs and researchers, our doctoral students also have zero input from, uh, in terms of speaking support in English. And so we also do a little bit of that because um, you can imagine this scenario where you have uh, an advisor who is, uh, who, for whom English is not their first language, advising a student for whom English is also not their first language. So um, we try to provide as much support as possible at the Academic Writing Center. And in 2022, 2023, um, we provided more than a thousand hours per year of proofreading for nearly a thousand participants. So we're quite pleased that we're trying to grow. Um, we're fairly new. And again, it's something that's free to all members of the Paris Saclay uh, community. So I can't stress that enough because there, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, predatory publishing out there um, and uh, which puts uh, international universities at somewhat of a disadvantage who don't have as much money as our United States counterparts. And um, to struggle to stay competitive internationally, it's really important that this was free to the entire community. So I'm very proud to be part of a six a member team, as I mentioned, uh, we have Divya as our founder, but also my colleagues, Daniela, Calvin, Andrew, and especially Alexandra. Um, we lean on each other, we support each other. We are constantly trying to figure out ways to serve our community. And for so many reasons that our previous, um, the previous speaker mentioned, you know, that mental uh, support, the social support, oftentimes because we are the only English speaking resource on campus. I'm not just an instructor. I end up being a confessor. I end up hearing all kinds of things. And so we're constantly thinking, how can we best serve our community? So that's enough about me. 
but what I wanted to get a sense for, um, because this is a workshop, I was wondering if I could hear from you, um, what population do you work with and what do you hope to gain from the workshop today? So please feel free, you can type it in the chat, you can, um, you can verbally uh, let me know who am I working with today. Could you say a few words about what the workshop's going to be about so that they know what to, which direction kind of to go in? Sure. Um, so in terms of okay. what the workshop is going to be about, um, um, I want to uh, just give a brief background of feedback washback, what that actually is, and explore the challenges that ESL writers face in academic and scientific contexts, and talk about some of the strategies that you could use for providing constructive feedback to ESL writers, and then um, time permitting, have some practical exercises to apply those strategies. So that's what we, I hope to. Okay, so I see in the chat, we have uh, pre-service teachers, um, heritage language teachers. Oh, that's uh, so amazing. I'm absolutely fascinated by that area. Um, higher grade students at private school, high school students, pre-college ESL students, wonderful secondary school teachers, university teachers. Okay, great. Thank you. That's excellent. Okay, so in terms of the organization, I'm sorry okay. to interrupt you, but I would say probably the vast majority of the, the silent majority here are, um, uh, you know, like public school teachers in Kyrgyzstan, right? Okay. Anisha? Anisha? Okay, so yeah, that's correct. Absolutely. Okay, great. College teachers strategies to improve our students' writing. Excellent. Okay. So although a lot of my context is going to be at the doctoral level, I, I do have some tips and tricks um, toward the end of the workshop for uh, classroom teachers, et cetera. So um, hang in there with me while I give you some background. So we're going to go over um, five parts here today. I'm going to just give you some background in parts one and two for understanding uh, feedback, washback, and the ESL writer. Um, we're then going to dive into some effective strategies that I found work for me in my particular context and how maybe you can um, apply those strategies to your own. Um, some common pitfalls uh, um, we might get into, but I want to zoom ahead to the practical application of, of um, how this might work. And then some closing uh, remarks. So um, in terms of understanding feedback washback, well, what is this? My guess is you recognize the feedback, but what exactly is washback? So um, in terms of feedback washback, uh, this is the impact or influence um, that feedback has, particularly in an educational context or assessment context on the learning and teaching processes. And you can see from the dates, this has been around for a while. It used to be called backwash, um, but it has evolved to be called Washback. Um, how I like to think of it, how I, I, I feel like it's a little bit more concrete for me, is it's what prompts instructors and learners to do things they wouldn't normally do so that they can encourage or maybe un, unintentionally limit language learning. And so this is the framework that we're going to work with today. So to throw um, to throw back to you the audience, um, what I was what I would like to see is what you think um, assessment impacts um, in in terms of the instructors or in terms of the learners. What do you think assessment can impact if we think about um, this definition of feedback washback and influencing the language learning processes? Time consuming, yeah, um, time, absolutely. Motivation, absolutely. Both teachers and students, right? <laughs> okay, common knowledge, if you don't test, they won't study, okay. Excellent. Performance, progress, great. <clears throat> okay, so everything that I see happening in the chat 
That is excellent effort, uh, effect testing on teaching and student learning production, all of these things. So in terms of how the research kind of divides these things up, we see instructors are um, trying to um, modify their teaching methods based on all of the things that some of you mentioned. They're looking at their language instruction, their classroom strategies. So that's the instructor side. So and on in terms of the learners, notice motivation is right there um, at the top. We also have how they decide to learn their language, but also I want to highlight life-changing outcomes. So for some of our ESL writers, um, we want to think about as instructors, what is this um, an assessment actually going to mean for them? It could mean that they lose a job. It could mean that they have to go back to their home country. All of these things come into play when we think about uh, this feedback washback, the impact that, um, that the learning process has. Okay, so uh, in terms of how we can think about it with, um, it, usually feedback washback is thought of as having two components. I have intensity and the direction. So in terms of the intensity, um, exactly what some of you mentioned in the chat um, is the degree to which students adjust their behavior to meet the demands of the assessment. And this is usually thought of as how important the assessment is in terms of the driving force, but it can also uh, be the timing. So of course you can imagine the closer we get to assessment day, the uh, more intense that washback is going to be for students and teachers alike. Um, but we can also think of intensity occurring in the following way, when students are motivated to succeed, when they believe they know how to be successful, and when they believe they have the resources to succeed. This is when we have the highest amount of washback. And this all really falls in line with my own experience in terms of what I see students happening. And then in terms of direction, when people talk about positive and negative. So this just has to do with how much the instruction um, or learning for the assessment aligns with what the assessment developer, developers actually intended. And so a lot of research initially was around design and contents, but more and more there's a focus on learners. So that's really what I wanna focus on today. But in terms of what it looks like, what positive washback looks like, this is when your educational goals, your curriculum are in line um, or are similar to teaching to a specific test. And negative would be when it's the complete abandonment of what you intended, of what you had hoped to achieve educationally, and you just prepare for the test and that's it. So those are the extremes. So I mentioned before that um, when, we, when it comes to instructors and learners, a lot of, there's been a lot of research with instructors and what we're doing, but um, in terms of learners, I kind of want to take a look at what our learners are experiencing as well and not just focusing on what teachers do, but what learners also bring to the table. So, um, so then I want to come to understanding the ESL writer. So for some of you out there, um, what are the challenges that you see your ESL writers um, struggling with or you see them experiencing? Oh my God, the list is endless, Melissa. <laughs> starting, from, starting from motivation to, you know, working through chaos and then uh, reflecting on whatever little they are able to sort through the chaos and um, you know there's just we should have another session exclusively for I know <laughs> I know right <laughs> so you can see I'm kind of um, I know that these are some questions that are easy to answer right maybe almost too easy so transition words collecting thoughts time lack of vocabulary uh, they learn to use the grammar, but then they don't use it. Mm -hmm. The lack of experience and brainstorming. Absolutely, all of these things are completely in line as well. So although we all come from different fields and experiences, um, what I'm seeing in the chat are exactly what I also see. So whether you're, um, you're serving children or you're, or you're still serving high-functioning adults at the academic level, a lot of the challenges are similar, but 
Aside from language proficiency, I also want to point out cultural differences. And this is something I've been more and more interested in, and I'm not going to touch too much upon in this workshop, but I do want to mention that dynamic and when you're working with writers and just how much cultural differences come into play. But I also want to emphasize for uh, academic writing is the lack of knowledge of the target audience. So when a writer is writing, um, are they considering the reader? Because writing at the end of the day is a social practice. It's although you're a solitary writing, it's not just there for you, it's for somebody else to actually interact with. So lack of the knowledge of the target audience is a big challenge that I see um, in, uh, in academic writing, uh, ESL writers in particular. Some common errors, as we mentioned, some grammar and word choice, but they also really, really struggle with lack of, care, of clarity, flow of sentences, et cetera. So it's great. I can see that we all know our audience quite well, our participants, our learners, and that's half the battle. Once you understand your audience, then you can start to give more uh, effective feedback to opti optimize again that positive washback to try and make sure that the, the learning that's taking place is actually enhancing the experience. Okay, so how does this actually work when we're trying to promote student growth? So I actually really like this table and I, uh, Manisha, I have a handout. So if people are interested, I can, I don't know if I can put it in the chat or not, or um, we can put it up uh, available for people um, that has this table along with the references. But I like to look at this because um, anytime I work with, a um, when I'm going from classroom to classroom, or even student to student, I'm constantly adjusting myself. And I'm constantly doing this based on what you see here on the table. So you can see it's organized in sort of seven, um, seven components and then with little questions that you the instructor can ask yourself in order to then try to construct some curriculum that is tailored to the uh, the the audience that you're working with the students that you're working with the learners that you're working with so i think it's a uh, it's really really useful for, for me to look at this because it does vary like i said from classroom to classroom um, even if i'm teaching the same course or from students to student so in terms of academic writing and the proofreading that I do, um, these are the things that really stand out for me when I'm working with the ESL writers that I encounter. So I have to think about what their investment because sometimes that changes from um, population to population, how invested are they in, um, in the assessment? And in this case, assessment is publication. <clears throat> what is their perception of the difficulty level? So whether they consider what they're doing difficult or not plays a huge role. What they already believe is an effective language learning strategy. So when you work with international students, they come from so many different backgrounds and they all have different beliefs of how you can effectively learn language. So some of them really want me to give them a ton of grammar uh, exercises because that's what they believe is the most effective strategy. And while others, all they want to do is uh, have a nice chat and talk and discuss. So keeping that in mind, um, then we have the knowledge of assessment. What do they already know um, as they're going to prepare for something? What is their commitment level? And by commitment, um, I mean that what are the resources that they have at their disposal um, in order to help them succeed? And um, what do they already know about the assessment? But for me, the most interesting um, column here when it comes to academic writing is the interactions between learners. Um, because the population that I work with, they are constantly presenting their work to others. They are constantly um, writing, they're constantly sharing, they're constantly giving feedback and receiving feedback. And so they're really actually learning from their community. So by the time I see them, usually their, their writing has gone through um, several different um, filters, so to speak. And knowing that is really helpful because <clears throat> They may have learned something, a misconception from um, a fellow student. They may have learned some incorrect grammar actually from their supervisor who is for whom English is not their first language as well. So knowing all of this is really important. <clears throat> Alyssa, can I can I just uh, say something? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut in. Uh, no, no. Professor Cohen will be very disappointed in me if I didn't remind you that 
um, the teachers have different English levels. So just speak a little slower. Sorry. <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, Sorry. I, I do that all the time. I do that all the time. And Miriam is there, thankfully, to remind me. But I, I, I'm sort of just paying it forward. I mean, just just, just to be mindful. I'm sorry if that... that Not know. at all. Not at all. Um, Thank you for reminding me. Like I mentioned, I, I've been ill, so I'm maybe talking faster than normal because I feel like I'm going to lose my voice at any moment. Okay. Um, so the profile of the writers that I have, so to give you the context that I work in, we have adults, doctoral students, postdocs, and faculty. They're all upper, and for the most part, upper intermediate level of English. And if you're within the European framework, that's a B2 level. And 80% of them are writing their first manuscript in English for publication uh, in a scientific journal. The rest of them, they've been writing for a long time or they're doing, they're, they've brought a different document for us to look at besides something for publication. And 10% of uh, the people I work with really enjoy writing and they love chatting about language. 80% are eager to learn because they're highly motivated. This is their career they have to uh, write for. And then we have that 10% who wants somebody else to write their document for, for them. And I'll get to them in a second. But the goal of all of these writers is publication and citation. So for me, for the assessment that I have to um, prepare our curriculum for, that I have to prepare for, um, for proofreading is uh, journal submission guidelines. And regardless of the field you're in, whether it's humanities, whether it's science, whether it's um, economics, they all say the same thing. You have to be clear and precise, you, even when um, sharing complex ideas. You have to avoid a lot of jargon. You have to vary your vocabulary. All of these things, the writers who come to the Academic Writing Center know these things because they're in all the journals. And uh, Strunk and White said it quite beautifully in their, um, <clears throat> in their, um, in their book about um, the elements of style. Uh, so what I see at the Academic Writing Center in terms of specifics, uh, in terms of language-based challenges is text flow, that finding that connection between sentences, uh, reducing their jargon, the sentence length, um, making informed decisions. So this is the one that I'm really passionate about, that um, they haven't yet developed uh, their own voice yet. Although like somebody mentioned in the chat, um, they know the grammar, rules, but they're not applying them right. They know that there are different variations. And at this level, um, I want to give them the autonomy to decide between, ooh, should I use active voice or should I use passive voice, these things like that. But we also have this added um, layer of motivational challenge. And um, why should academic writing even, why does it need to be reader friendly? Shouldn't the science speak for itself? So languaging over grammar, I see somebody has put Absolutely. So then um, the challenge, though, because our ESL writers see that the their um, fellow colleagues who are for whom English is their first language, they are writing like this. They're not necessarily writing for the reader either. <laughs> they are creating these big words, complex sentences, um, soggy syntax, as Helen Sword um, so beautifully put it. Um, and so they're emulating that. So even for whom, for the people for whom English is their first language, they're not doing a great job either, but the ESL writers see that and they copy what they see. So we have to also kind of battle that. Again, that, that interaction between learners, what they're already seeing between learners. So given that, our curriculum for our courses cover these topics um, because we know what the, um, what the goal is for our writers. Um, so notice they're not really, um, they're not grammar-based necessarily, but there are these kind of um, sort of organizational um, topics like reader and writer considering how the reader reads, topic and stress, cohesion, I mentioned choice of voice. Um, formal structures, text reduction methods, and then specific things like the sections of a journal article. 
So the general learning goal of our courses is um, trying to give our writers impactful writing and try to enhance the skills they already have and making informed choices. And so this, um, I will show they have, that has given us positive washback because um, we are actually in line with what the journal guidelines want. They want, you know, um, active voice. They want uh, short sentences, clear and concise and precise, et cetera. So that's how we've designed our curriculum. So the uh, proofreading sessions, uh, this is kind of the special aspect of it that I wanted to get into some detail. And um, these are all online for the most part, and they're one hour. And the special thing about it is that I never receive a document ahead of time. So the first time I see the paper is the first time uh, the, the writer shares their screen, actually. And um, we have an open dialogue. We go line by line. And what this means is because most manuscripts are roughly 20 pages, it takes about six to eight sessions to completely proofread a paper. And so um, it takes this long because we are also providing explanations as we go. And so my goal when somebody brings a document to me is to give the writer autonomy, is to give them a voice, is to not put my fingers all over the paper, but let it be authentic with what the, what the writer intends. Plus also to keep in mind the goals of scientific writing, which is to be reader friendly. So that's the context that I wanted to um, give everyone here. And so then I would like to move on to effective feedback strategies. So a lot of you said, I wanna know how to get them to do this. And the way in my experience um, that I've managed to get there, so to speak, is through these seven um, sort of components here, setting expectations, creating a supportive environment, focusing on the writing and not the writer, encouraging self-reflection and self-correction, using clear and concise language, giving specific examples, and then providing follow-up support. So I'm going to dive into each of those um, criteria <clears throat> in the following slides. So when it comes to getting maximizing the washback, maximizing the intensity, maximizing the positivity, making sure that everything is um, empowering the students. The first thing I do, the first time I meet any of the students is to tell them the following things that are specific to proofreading. So I tell them that all of the corrections are done in real time. I don't receive the document beforehand, so don't send it to me. <laughs> um, I expect that uh, they all have checked their documents for grammar and that it's also checked for scientific accuracy. Like I mentioned, I, I hop from different uh, fields um, all day long. So I'm not the expert in all of the different domains I work in. So I have to trust that the, it's been checked for scientific accuracy by the peer group. And then I read every sentence out loud. Uh, any guesses about why I would do that? Why I read uh, the sentence out loud? So they can hear the language and find mistakes. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, um, so I, I see a question in the context. Do you mean in proofreading process, students take time to review their writings and improve for better? How much time do they need? Or day, so um, this these sessions are all one hour long, and so they have one hour, and we go through their documents starting from the title, and then we just work through the whole document. And the goal of the proofreading is to ch have a dialogue about the um, linguistic correctness of the document, as well as um, whether or not it satisfies them to make sure that the corrections are not sacrificing accuracy. And so I hope that answers your question. So um, so what Manisha said, yes, absolutely. We read the sentence out loud and I'm going to come back to that um, again, but um, it, it serves a lot of different purposes, um, but it allows them to actually be a participant also by hearing what I'm saying. I'm not just being a model, but I'm also developing what we call the writerly ear. 
I also give all of the corrections verbally. So I, um, I tell them that straight away, I'm going to give you a correction verbally and I'm going to tell you why that correction is made. So that way they can start to understand how they might use that later on in their writing. <clears throat> and then this is also key, the writer makes the correction themselves. So I give them a correction, I give them an explanation for why we have a little dialogue about whether or not that's appropriate and it matches the scientific accuracy. And then the writer makes a decision to correct it themselves or, or not. They can reject my suggestion if they like. And I'll talk about that as well later. And then um, this is really, really key as well in terms of setting expectations. The corrections that we provide are expected to evolve over time. And this is to avoid the people who come and just want us to rewrite the paper. <laughs> because if they just expect uh, me to say, okay, change that the, take out the apostrophe, do this, do that, um, that's not going to uh, allow them to grow as a student. It's not going to allow them to evolve. So um, if I find that they're not quite um, getting it, it's either because they're not motivated or um, they expect me to write the paper for them. So I set that out straight away to get ahead of it and say, um, I expect, and this usually happens. 90% uh, of the time, I would say by the end of that hour or by the middle of the second hour I have with them, they start to say, oh, that doesn't sound right. So can I change it to this? So they do start to evolve and the kinds of feedback I'm giving them changes as they are learning. And it's a, it's a wonderful experience to see them changing and growing in that way. The second thing uh, to keep in mind when you're trying to, um, uh, to interact with ESL writers is to create a supportive environment. Um, again, we don't quite know what their dynamic is with their peers, with their advisors. So I try to create a safe uh, space for them during these sessions. And um, I assure them that this is their document. It's not my document, it's theirs. And it's their voice that needs to shine through. It's their, um, their thoughts, their conclusions, their ideas. And I'm just there to help them um, make sure that it's uh, linguistically um, accurate, but beyond that, it's their document. And I think they really appreciate that. I also like to point out when they've used language appropriately. So especially if I'm, if I'm working on a sentence and there's something problematic with it, I like to reference a previous sentence where they actually use that appropriately. Like, oh yeah, you know, this sentence looks great. You've got a really strong verb choice or, oh, the flow here is excellent. I like the way you put that. And then, you know, just to try to point out when they've done things correctly. Um, like I mentioned before, I'd like to check in to see whether or not they approve of the correction. This is really, really important with scientific writing because a lot of complaints that I hear people have about um, proofreading um, houses that you have to pay for because they take the document away and then bring it back is that the researchers horrified, like this is not at all accurate. So it's really important that again, we have that open dialogue and that I haven't suggested something that actually goes against what they wanted, um, scientifically speaking. And then I also ask the writer if there are any problems or clarifications in particular they'd like to discuss. So oftentimes we have a little work plan also. So I might say, okay, today we're going to focus on the introduction but is there something else you're, you want to focus on? And if they say, oh yes, um, I need to look at my methods section or whatever, and then we can go and take a look at that. <clears throat> so in terms of um, another strategy that you can use to provide effective feedback to increase that washback effect is to focus on the writing and not the writer. So, um, I like to do this in some ways to take a step back about the bigger goal that academic writing has. So we want to remind the writer to always keep the reader in mind. So it's not just about um, what they are doing, what they're writing, but how they're communicating that to the reader. Keeping the reader in mind is really important. And it helps take the, also the focus out of um, the person. And we're just talking about how are we communicating with each other. And then I like to provide a technique. So I'm going to show you a little example of 
uh, something that occurred in a, a proofreading session I had. So um, a writer came to the uh, academic writing center and the original sentence is the one you see here. So the first I began by reading it out loud. Recent works on embedded right. conversational no, agents. I just wanna give you a 10 minute heads up. Okay, yeah. Um, so the, so we, we have the original sentence and um, when uh, I read it out loud, I had to take a breath. And so I said to the reader, this is too long because I had to take a breath. So this is the first sentence of the paper as well. So we want to try and give a lighter introduction to the topic. So what can we do to naturally divide the sentence in two? We had an open dialogue and then um, this is what we came out um, with, with the output. So um, again, just trying, I'm not, I didn't say this isn't correct. I didn't say uh, you've done something wrong here. I framed it just more about what is the reader need and what do you need to do? Okay, in terms of uh, encouraging self-reflection and self-correction, this is why I read it out loud to also allow them a chance to hear the mistake because often they, they hear it um, because they've read their paper a million times. And when they hear it, they develop that writerly ear. Um, also, when it comes to clear and concise communication and giving specific examples, I actually like to pull things from our course curriculum into the proofreading sessions in order to help them, <clears throat> in order to help them understand. So this is just an example of, uh, of a slide from my class. Um, it's a slide that's about um, subject verb object placement and how in scientific writing, we wanna try and keep the subject and the verb as close to, as possible without interruption. So what I'll do in the proofreading session is bring in the slide. This is somebody else's writing from Gopin and Swan. And I work actually work on this with the student and then they see what we're trying to get at on somebody else's writing. So again, it's stepping away from the writer. And then I go back and say, so how can we try to move that subject and the verb closer together given what we did in this other person's writing? So pulling in the curriculum um, into the writing. So how do we know this works? Well, we have our writers that come back um, um, and their manuscripts are accepted for publication. Our courses are usually full within a week of opening registration, but also they do an anonymous survey where they tell us that um, uh, here are the things that I've applied from my proofreading sessions. Here are the things that I've learned and I recommend it for um, people <clears throat> um, from others. And what about the 10% that aren't motivated? my advice is to just give them something concrete that usually works well because normally uh, the the unmotivated students i work with are um are very pragmatic they're like my brother uh they want a concrete reason and this will usually help them turn a corner but sometimes it isn't at all about motivation and it's about the actually about the language level so um, you can see on the bottom, if that's the case, if somebody comes and they have lower intermediate level, then our recommendation is that they try to support themselves with some general, more general English courses um, because they're going to struggle if they don't um, try to improve their writing and to get it up to the same level as their colleagues. <clears throat> so um, I wanted to give this out to you because I know that not everyone here is working with doctoral students who are trying to publish and they don't have six to eight hours to spend with each student in a class of 30, right? <laughs> so if you wanna benefit from positive washback, try to get the whole class involved. And this little step, it will take maybe three to four weeks, but um, it will get have that sort of same environment of getting other learners involved and um, trying to shore up their confidence as well. So the first step is of course, um, give the assignment and they do it at home. And then when they come to school, they can um, have three other students read the essay and those three students each give three comments then the student rewrites the essay at home and the student can choose whether or not to take those comments. They don't have to accept them, but if they don't accept them, they have to give a justification why. And then you, the instructor collects and corrects the essay and evaluates the comments and you return the essay the following day. The student gives their own essay a grade and a brief a reason why. 
as well as the other students who gave them uh, their comments earlier. And then the final step is when the teacher reveals the teacher's grade and the students and the teachers all agree on a final grade. And um, this was reported by Lacey back in January and um, this worked really well. And this was for um, grade school students. So um, if you're working with children, if you're working with adults, if you're working with uh, teenagers, this seems to work really well. And in particular, it gives, um, because this, the teacher is not involved until step four, uh, it's all of their peers. And this works really well with kids, right? Because kids listen to their friends more than they listen to the teacher, right? So if, they're, if their friend says, oh, the monster came in too late here, where's the monster? Uh, they're going to fix that over you telling them, oh, there's not enough excitement at the climax. You didn't provide um, a problem to solve or something like that. Their, their peers will know how to communicate that to them. And so this is how you can use this little table based on um, what you're doing um, with your own population and what their goals are and what the assessment demands are. You can take a look at this. And I think that could help because um, it helped me to develop curriculum, to develop ideas for how to get that ESL writer, um, uh, uh, their own voice, authenticity, um, autonomy, all of it um, when you're doing um, writing examples. Okay, so I did want to get uh, give a quick um, practical application. Um, so uh, please don't be intimidated by the uh, the sentence here. But I just wanted to show that um, we have a sentence that somebody brought um, and uh, to point out that the problem about this was that the repetition of of so of 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 um, and we gave this sentence to two different proofreaders and then the writer um, had to choose between one or the other. Any guesses of uh, which one the writer chose and why? Two, mm -hmm. okay. And you would be correct. It was in fact two. Um, so um, when we asked why that was, the, the writer said, ah, this was, uh, it broke it into two sentences and, um, and it stayed truer to what I was hoping. So you'll notice in the first one, the proofreader left out the idea of figure two and it's here, or figure four, sorry, and it's here in the second one. So that was staying more true to what the writer had intended. Okay, um, so then uh, I just wanted to also give this little scenario. We won't talk about it too much because uh, I know we're short on time, but um, just to show you that when somebody submits a paper for publication, often the feedback they give is, it's poor, please revise, and that's it. <laughs> There's nothing more. They have no idea what they're supposed to do to help improve their paper. And this is exactly why the writing, uh, the Academic Writing Center was created so that if you don't have a, somebody in your group who, for whom English is their first language, you can be completely lost at what you're supposed to do to improve your paper and to try and do that in two weeks as well. And um, when you see the example sentence here, um, they definitely needed some help, some input, some guidance. And so thinking about how to frame uh, and use these strategies um, to interact with the uh, with the students um, is something that needs to be done if we want our writers to have autonomy, if we want our uh, writers to have authenticity in their own voice. Um, so that's just the, the little scenario that um, I'm sorry that we don't have time for. So uh, just a quick recap of the things that I mentioned. That again, that when we talk about feedback washback, this is the impact that uh, educational or assessment has on learning and teaching processes. Um, and we as instructors can use this knowledge to ensure that there's a high intensity of positive washback. In other words, that our writers are learning, um, that they're motivated to learn and they're succeeding and that they're growing. 
And these effect, these strategies um, should include the, um, the seven things that I mentioned about expectations and interacting um, in order to give the writer their own voice to help them with the challenges that are specific to ESL writers and um, to just uh, watch them grow as a writing. So uh, just to say thank you. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to uh, email me and you can scan the QR code there if you like. It takes, us to, uh, takes you to the website for the Academic Writing Center. And um, thanks again for inviting me to this talk. Okay, so I see in the chat, uh, please yeah. send the document again. Okay. They're talking to Manisha about the participation document, but that last comment about, you know, like sort of shorter English language, you know, ESL class kind of um, essays that they're writing. I think that's a great question. So you do you that? support students also yeah. to identify the correct thesis statements, topic sentence, and each that writing during feedback, washback sessions, what technique do you use to improve the students' problems in academic writing? So it really depends from student to student um, how I deal with them. Um, it really, um, it modifies. In terms of uh, topic sentences, you're, you've hit it on the nose, those can be very problematic. So um, what I actually have is a slide that I show uh, um, that has to do with topic stress organization. So that's probably the slide I use the most and that I didn't get into here, where I give them the idea that they put uh, old information at the beginning of the sentence, new information at the end of the sentence, and then that new information becomes the old information. And in that way, they can actually organize their, uh, their paragraph in such a way that it flows. So they don't have to know too much about cohesion just yet. They don't have to know uh, too much about transition signals uh, and using those appropriately. All they have to do is to put the information in the, in the correct spots within the sentence, and that creates the flow. So that's what I tend to do. I'm not sure how much time I have to answer some of these questions, Anisha. Oh, I don't know about that, but I have a question for you, Melissa. Sure. Um, do you guys also run like writing academic courses um, in terms of, you know, you just said that there is a gap in building coherence. So I mean, how do you ensure that a, uh, a research writer or, or, or a university graduate is also is also eventually becoming an independent writer. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm support is one thing, but uh, building those skills is a is kind of a different thing altogether. Mm -hmm. but I think um, people at any level, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> need somebody to bounce their thing off. You know, I need somebody to read my cover letter. You know, like. Stuff like that. Um, so th because when they come to a proofreading session, um, it really is all pedagogy. It's basically their own tailored, um, say, uh, session on cohesion or a session on, um, on topic stress. So if they come in and what I see and I read their, uh, their I read, say, the abstract, and I notice there aren't connections within the sentence. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I do is I say, OK, so let's take a look at this paragraph. The feedback you got from the reviewer indicates that they're not sure about the organization. And I have a tip for you. I have a technique, and it's called cohesion. And then I would bring up my slides from our courses, because not everybody takes our courses. So I just happen to have that in my back pocket. Right, and I have uh, a diagram that has techniques like using, you know, shell nouns, like using uh, transition signals within uh, within reason, using synonyms, using pronouns, ref reference words, all of these things, and I actually show them all these little techniques, and then I say, okay, I go back to the writing, and I say, okay, based on the sentences within this paragraph, what can we use? What techniques can we already use? 
should we should we use transition signals here? Are we going or maybe a, a pronoun here? Or do we want to repeat a term? Because that will provide also cohesion based on the little mini lesson I just gave them. And that's how that's how I initially start. And as I go through the hour and I'm finding this to be maybe um, a problem that they have consistently, that they're not providing flow between sentences, they actually start to pick up on it. And they said, oh, actually, so I can see that this isn't, uh, this isn't uh, following cohesion, can I maybe use a reference word? And I said, I'm, I'll agree or disagree depending on what they've already written. And I can actually see th how they're applying it. I can actually see when they don't get it. And I can, I can work on that individually. Did that answer um, your question? Amazing. Manisha? Yes, absolutely. Okay. You have been able to fold support and pedagogy together. I mean, that's, that's where they, that's, that there's a point where they both converge. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting excited sitting in the chair. If I could just stand up on my chair. <laughs> hey, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Great work. Great work, Melissa. I, I'm really getting tempted here to say that I will speak to our assistant director and, and see if we can sort of have you for one of our PD sessions at Temple. Just be ready for that. Okay. But, but I'm going to be, I'm gonna be <laughs> Sounds in Sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I see someone said, we would love to see that um, slideshow about cohesion. So I can tell you that my Bible uh, for anyone who's interested in academic uh, writing is this one here that's right next to my thing, uh, teaching academic L2 writing. Uh, so... <clears throat> <laughs> and so this is um, where I get a lot of my information from, where I get some of my um, examples, et cetera. Um, but yeah, we have, a like I, I showed earlier, we have our courses with these specific topics in mind and how we teach it to our students. And I could spend three hours on cohesion, <laughs> so, which is why I didn't cover it here. <laughs> That's Manisha's favorite thing. Oh yeah, yeah. I, can, I, can, I, can, I can almost relate to what she's saying. All the, all the issues and why cohesion was left out. It's it's a scary territory. You start it and then you don't know where to. It has no boundaries. <laughs> Melissa, for for our audience, could you do one favor? Could you just type out the name of that book with the yes, with the, absolutely. If anybody's mm -hmm. interested, that would be lovely. So we're about to wrap up. Um, if there's any further questions, particularly, okay, great. People are putting further questions in the chat. We're gonna leave the um, Zoom room open. Um, if anyone wants to stay and chat with your coworkers, uh, that would be wonderful for informal sharing. We'll turn off the, um, the uh, recording. But thank you so much to all of our presenters. It's so great to have you, Jinara. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, very saturated, fruitful two days. So we see everybody uh, noticed that the conferences are becoming better and better. Great. We will be oh. looking for the fifth design thinking conference. We would like to express our great gratitude to our presenters of the day first and day second. Wonderful presentation, dear.